Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, I have a discussion with the professor of English, social commentator, and uh, social critic, Janice Fiamengo. Janice may not be well-known around the world, but I think she should be more well-known for her remarkably cogent commentary, both her writing and her videos, in particular her videos for the Fiamengo file that she produced, which confront a major issue, feminism, from a different perspective. In her most recent set of videos, she actually discusses the history of feminism and demonstrates that much conventional wisdom about its history is, is actually misplaced. Janice is not a, a, an ideologue or a firebrand. She's a calm and very gentle speaker, but her arguments are full of logic and data, which is something I particularly appreciate. I really enjoyed my conversation with her, and I think you'll find it provocative at the very least. Uh, But I hope you'll listen to what she says, because after all, freedom of speech is really the freedom to listen. And uh, she may change some of your views, as as she's affected some of mine. Uh, It was a real pleasure to talk with her, and I I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. You can watch it ad-free by subscribing to our Substack channel, Critical Mass, and all proceeds from subscriptions will go to supporting the nonprofit Origins Project Foundation, which supports the podcast and several other activities. Or you can watch it on our YouTube channel, or you can listen to it anywhere where podcasts can be listened to. Either way, I hope that you will enjoy the podcast and it will be entertaining and uh, cause you to think, which is really the point of it all. Thanks. Well, Janice, I, I really appreciate your coming on the podcast. I, I, as you know, I've been a fan of yours for some time. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for, for having me on your show. Well, you know, I, I first discovered you from your videos, and I was always impressed by their strict logic and, and, and detail and how willing you were to go against conventional wisdom when the conventional wisdom is nonsense. And, uh, and that's something I've always been impressed with. So it's a real privilege to talk to you. And in fact, for full disclosure also, I, I, you were actually one of the panelists that we had planned to have on the very first Origins Project Foundation public event in Phoenix. And it was, it was planned. And then, and then unfortunately the world decided COVID would get in the way. And, yeah. um, and maybe we'll redo it again sometime and, and have you in, in, in person in Phoenix, I hope so. I was really sorry to miss the opportunity. You had uh, a really nice lineup there. It was a great lineup and, and, and rather press. Oh, I thought it was prescient, but I, of course, people like you are aware of the issues that, w- that we were going to talk about for years before. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about. But this is an Origins podcast. And that means I, w- I first go into Origins. I want to discover what led you to the path that you eventually took to, to where you're at now and, and, and the things you've talked about. You, 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 you grew up in BC, right? Yes. And, and, yeah. and, 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 but one thing I don't know is were your parents, um, I mean, you, you obviously decided to become an academic. Uh, did, were your parents uh, academics at all or? No, or? my mom uh, had worked at, a, at an insurance company and she quit her job when she had me. So I had a fairly traditional, I guess I would say lower middle class, I grew up in a kind of lower middle class, working class neighborhood. And I, uh, my, my dad's sister taught creative writing at the University of British Columbia. So I did have that connection. Um, I'm did not that sure. In, did that yeah, I don't know you? how much that, it, it must have influenced me. But, I, you know, I wasn't aware, like, you know, of particularly choosing to follow my dad's sister's path. But she was a, you know, she was a, a major figure in my life. I loved her. And uh, she loved literature and always bought me books. And but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was genetic. I love to read, you know, from my mom and dad read to me from before I could read. And I I don't even remember learning to read. It seemed to come naturally. And, you know, I just always I wanted to write. I wanted to talk about books from the time I was probably, you know, in my early teens. I wanted to be a teacher. by the time I was in high school, I think I, I wanted to teach at a university if I could. I didn't think I would, but, um, and yeah, I just, you know, I just, I was one of those, I was an only child. So that probably contributed to it as well. I just, I loved 
I, I spent all my time really uh, just sitting by myself reading and, and being uh, enchanted by words and imaginary worlds and just wanting to, to talk about language and you know stories and, and what stories do and all of that. And so that's what I did. I, I, I had um, just a, a wonderful time at university. I did a master's degree. I, I thought I would stop then. I taught for a while as a, a sessional instructor, part-time instructor at the University of British Columbia and at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And But then I decided, why not keep going? I love this. So I did a PhD and, and I got a job at the University of Saskatchewan. I taught there for four years. It was a wonderful place. And I got a job at the University of Ottawa and I taught there for the next 16, 17 years before I took early retirement. And um, yeah, I, it, uh, it was a very smooth path for me. And I, I imagined that I would do that, you know, until they kicked me out. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I love, you know, it's such a privileged job, you know, to be able to do the thing you love uh, mm -hmm. and get paid very well for it. And uh, to have so much time relatively free time to to do one's own writing and research and really to be able to shape one's own research profile and all of that it was it was just it was lovely at the same time of course I was becoming aware of um, the darker currents that are have have overtaken I would say academia now the obsession with victimhood and and remedying victimhood uh and um yeah i i so i started to to speak about that and and the, the thing i knew best was of course feminist ideology um the feminist approach to literature is a dominant one and i had studied feminist theory for years when i was a phd student and i uh, was just taken for granted that that's the perspective that one taught from uh, including other victim oriented uh, theories such as post-colonialism and anti-racism and all of those kinds of things and and uh, uh, yeah I just I, I reached a point where uh, you know I, it started gradually I, 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 I stopped really identifying as a feminist because I became aware of what a just unforgiving relentlessly aggressive and mean-spirited and simplistic kind of perspective it offered. I looked out at all the young men, well, there weren't that many of them, but you know, they're about 20% of, of um, the ordinary English literature class. But I looked out at those young men and I, it was just so obvious to me that not only were they not privileged and entitled and oppressors, um, but that they were, uh, well, bewildered, um, shamed often, unable to voice um, their life experience in any way that would be validated. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I just, I, I couldn't go on pretending that everything women did was to be celebrated, that women were these heroic survivors who had overcome generations of sexism and now must be celebrated. And men were always, you know, these privileged oppressors who didn't care about women, who in fact objectified and oppressed and hated them, held them back and should now uh, in, in recompense for the sins of their fathers, step back entirely and allow women to take over the world because women would do a much better job of it allegedly i, I that just you know I, I i i couldn't be a part of it anymore and and finally about uh i guess just about 10 years ago now i gave my first public lecture speaking against feminist criticism and really the whole orientation towards grievance studies and, and victimology that is so popular at every university in North America. And so, and then I started making my, um, my videos, the Fiamengo file. Wow. Well, I, this is great. Your, 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 your monologue just now covered much of many of the questions I had and anticipated them of, of your background. It's a perfect description of where you are. I, I, there were a few things I wanted to fill in. Um, so you did your PhD 
also at UBC, uh, yes. at UBC. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to point out, you'd studied feminist, as you said, you studied fem feminist theory. Your PhD, as I understand it, was actually about uh, female journalists in early Canada. Is that the case? So it was actually yeah. kind of a, a feminist kind of uh, uh, view of, of journalism. It was. it was, yes. I, it was, it was, it's called, um, well, the, the book I published um, based on the, the uh, thesis was called The Woman's Page. And it was about women writers in general, essayists, novelists, uh, but especially journalists, also public speakers, activists in uh, late 19th century, early 20th century Canada. And, and really, I think writing that, although I was certainly steeped in feminist theory at the time, it, it also, it made me realize that the feminist view of history simply wasn't true in that here were women writing uh, over a hundred years prior to when I was talking about them. And they didn't see themselves as oppressed, uh, and well, at least most of them didn't. A number of them were feminists and were able to articulate their stridently feminist and even quite uh, vociferously anti-male views, even back then in the 1880s, 1890s, first decade of the 20th century. Um, they found a willing audience. Their um, radicalism was celebrated. They were able to, to make careers out of voicing these heterodox opinions. And in fact, they had a great deal of authority and legitimacy as women speaking to these various social issues. So I realized that something had to be wrong in the feminist version of history if these women were able to give voice to very radical ideas and in some cases to live very unconventional lives with very few limitations, re relative, relatively little mm. criticism or opposition. And, and so that was what started me, oh, I think, on my journey away from the feminist perspective. Although that was quite a, a while before you eventually gave the talks. In fact, you've explained, I sent a question that I wanted to answer, I guess. I, you know, we started at University of Ottawa when, when in 2009, which was at, when you were by many standards, somewhat older than, 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 and so I wondered what you had done in between, but part of it was uh, teaching, but. Um... No, it was actually 2003. Oh. Uh, and, yeah. And I, I, my first job was at the university of Saskatchewan. I started there in 1999. I'd had oh. a postdoc before okay. then. I actually okay, got my so... PhD in 1996. So I was a little bit older. Like I was in my early thirties by the time I got my my first Teaching. job, uh, first full job at the University mm -hmm. of Saskatchewan. I'd taken a little bit, three years off between my master's and my PhD. So I was that little bit older than, than most PhDs. Did, did, I, I, it may be too intrusive to ask, did you, during those three years, did you w w work at something else interesting? You didn't go fishing or anything. <laughs> no, I didn't do anything interesting. I taught, I taught, I taught at, at you know at UBC and SFU, and yeah, I, uh, I thought at that point that that I you know I might get a college job. At that yeah. point, you could easily get a college job. Yeah. There are lots of colleges in in Vancouver, so I thought that I might like to do that. But then I just thought I'm going to keep on because okay. I like this so much. Now, when it, you um. In your after the, uh, I'm interested in your academic um, sort of specialty after after the the, uh, the the PhD on 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 female journalists in early Canada. What was was your research area or or area of publications also related to f sort of feminist things or wasn't it, did it go yeah. in a different area? It was. It was basically that, yeah. And I I became I think what someone might call a member of the loyal opposition. I was still kind of working within feminist frameworks. I was still working mainly on women writers, though not entirely. Um, my focus was still the early um, uh, 20th century, late 19th century in, in Canada, although I started broadening out to um, British 19th century writers. Um, but yeah, it was still basically, I, I was especially interested in, in um, nonfiction writers, uh, those who wrote about social issues and how literature and, and um, just cultural discourse in general uh, was impacted by changing by social movements, that, that sort of thing. But, but I was, you know, I was questioning, I think, the, the dominant frameworks of the academy 
Good thing to do, and you and you and you started to do it in a wonderful way. And I, I you said your first, you gave your first talk on on sort of, and and let's make it clear, you define yourself as an anti-feminist, and we'll get to that. And I think that's a, incredibly interesting. But you gave your first public talk on this in two thousand fourteen. What, uh, how how did that arise, and what was the response of your colleagues and at the time? It was actually in 2013. Okay. Yeah, in, in March of 2013. How it arose was that um, in in the fall of 2012, I had seen the um, planned lecture by Warren Farrell. Do you know who Warren Farrell is? Uh, I think I saw him referred. I think I saw it when I was re reading and going through many, all of your stuff lately. I saw that name come up, and now I can't remember. He's um, he, he's a, a major. He was a feminist. Uh, he was involved oh, in the right. uh, National Organization of Women, mm -hmm. but he he broke from feminism for the same reasons that I did. Really, he he found its relentless anti male animus mm -hmm. unendurable. Uh, and though he always has expressed a great deal of sympathy for women and for for feminist issues, he wanted to broaden the discourse to bring in men's issues too. Mm -hmm. he, he, I think, became famous when he published a book in the 1970s called The Myth of Male Power, which I would recommend to anybody who is skeptical about whether <laughs> there are legitimate men's mm -hmm. issues or whether mm -hmm. the feminist narrative is, is inadequate in any way. It's a, it's a marvelous, marvelous, still extremely engaging and accessible book about about men's issues and um you know and the and just the um the inaccuracy of much of what feminism has to say about masculine entitlement and male power so uh he was um was to speak at the university of toronto in the fall of 2012 and he was actually speaking about um the boy crisis which has become his his that's his big topic really over the last 10 and more years he's the sort of writer who researches everything exhaustively that's he's so statistics on it everything mm -hmm. he's just incredible and uh, you know he's become very concerned over the last couple of decades about what's happening to boys in our culture with all of the emphasis on making sure that girls grow up in a pro-female environment and schools being taken over entirely by female and usually feminist teachers and the effects of fatherlessness on boys and the difficulty boys have in finding male role models and what happens to them psychologically and emotionally when they're told that, you know, really their sex is responsible for everything evil in the world and that their very sexuality, their very nature is harmful. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's uh, looked into that extensively. And so that's what he was going to be talking about at the University of Toronto. And he was gonna be brought in by a group called the Canadian Association for Equality, and they had a there was a men's issues awareness student group there that wanted to have him come speak. And there was this huge protest. Oh yeah, that's right. I saw that protest in one of your videos. I think yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was it was it was um, it was the first protest of that nature I'd ever seen. They're now standard on yeah. university campuses, and I'm sure there had been many before this. Well, I, I know there had been because I started researching it then, but. Um, but this was the first one that um, that I saw and uh, that was so clearly wrong in every way. The students that uh, attended that protest knew nothing about Warren Farrell. They hadn't read him. They weren't <laughs> protesting him. Yeah. Uh, they were protesting because their women's studies teacher had taken a single quotation of uh, out of one of his books from decades previously, taken it out of context and allege that he was some sort of rape apologist, which of course was the phrase de jour yeah. at the time. Every man who spoke in any way skeptically about feminist claims about sexual assault and sexual harassment was a rape apologist. So they came out to make sure that nobody could attend his talk. And yeah. they ripped the posters down, they blocked the entranceways and exits, they gave the Hitler salute to the campus security who were attempting to keep order there. They verbally harassed, screamed at, yelled obscenities at the people who were trying to attend the talk. 
uh, one of the young men who was caught on camera by my person who eventually became my collaborator, Street Steve Brule, who filmed the entire debacle. One of the young men there was there because he had had two friends. He was 18 or 19. He'd had two friends commit suicide in the past year, and he was hoping that he might find some closure or at least some understanding from hearing Warren Farrell speak. But he had he was subject to a bunch of screaming harridans with nose rings telling him that that you know he was a fascist because he wanted to hear Warren Farrell. So I saw that and I was of course you know appalled and not really surprised and I contacted that group the Canadian Association for Equality and said look if you've got a chapter in at in Ottawa I'd be really happy to be involved in any way, even just as a like a mentor mm -hmm. to young men if they want to come and talk to me about some of the feminist ideology that they're being presented with in their classes, I'd be happy to be a sounding board or just, you know, just give emotional support, really. I already <laughs> knew there was nothing much that could be done about it institutionally. Uh, you know, the, the, the force of uh, feminist ideology on campuses was already so dominant. Um, but anyway, so that's what I said, and they invited me to speak the following uh, spring, and so I did. I went down there and spoke, and um, you know, Toronto was about a six-hour drive from Ottawa for anybody who doesn't know, and it uh, it was protested. The fire alarm, protested. yeah, you know, for the first three or four years of my life, I never gave a, a talk <laughs> that wasn't protested, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, you know, they pulled the fire alarm and. Uh, you know all of that and and i gave other talks after that that were also um there's a famous that, famous one at university of ottawa library that that, <laughs> that i heard about maybe you could talk about that for a second yeah yeah there well there was one at the university oh. of ottawa itself that was prevented by the banging of drums and the singing of the communist international uh <laughs> that one was really that was really crazy mm -hmm. and um yeah i gave one at kingston that talk in in at Queen's University in Kingston did eventually go forward um, with a lot of objection and heckling and all of that. I gave, yeah, I tried to give one at the uh, Ottawa Public Library where Antifa and, you know, affiliated groups came out and chanted, fuck Fiamengo and, <laughs> you know, held up uh, banners saying no platform for hate speech and, you know, all those sorts of things. So, so yeah, I, I got a firsthand glimpse of the um, maniacal, <laughs> ideological intransigence of um, the, the sorts of students who are being um, yeah. nurtured on university campuses. So uh, yeah, that was that that was when I, when I first heard about this, I remember it surprised me because your your mannerism is anything but aggressive or or in your face. It's it's it's, it's as by by nature, you, you know if you. If just listening to you for two minutes, it's clear that you're not you're not a strident, you know, and it's so it's, it's ideologue and 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 it amazes me that people can in any way listen to you for two minutes and talk about hate speech. That's that's what I, I just found mm -hmm. find incredible. But in any case, um, it happens. I I I I think I've already mentioned once on this podcast, but I know uh, back when we lived in Oregon and I, first time we saw it was uh, my wife attended a talk at a small liberal arts college with very woke and 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 i guess it was christina huff summers i think was speaking mm. but the students wouldn't it was a lot at the law school which surprised me and the students wouldn't let her speak and the law faculty were there and no one everyone just sort of sat there and it, I mean, you'd think in a law school that there'd be some semblance of the notion of free speech that at, le at the very yeah. least and uh um and and uh and, and and such radical things as as saying that that there were intrinsic biological differences between men and women uh like for example men on average taller than women were mm. shouted down yeah but no that's not true i mean and mm -hmm. it, so, and um in any case yeah. uh i have to before we i you know i'm winning we'll get we'll get to a, hopefully a lot of things you there's so much here to unpack with you but um i have to ask you 20 percent. you say 20 percent of the students in the in the in the um 
uh, lit, PhD program in literature or whatever are, are were male when you were about that. Yeah, just before I left the University of Ottawa, we had to do one of those program mm -hmm. reviews where uh -huh. you know you may write a mm -hmm. huge hundred page report on every aspect of the department's programming. Mm -hmm. And I and I remember then um, we did have a gender breakdown of our students, and at that point it, it you know changed slightly from year to year, but it was around eighty four to 16 female to male. Has there ever been a, a large movement or the government say, suggesting that somehow that we have to do something about the male, um, uh, paucity of males in, in, in literature? Has there any been? What do you think? <laughs> There's never a movement yeah, to do no. anything. And, you know, and English literature is not even the worst, I yeah, don't think, although it's worst. probably one of the worst. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in education, like the entire yeah. faculty of education, the social sciences, um, they've been like, they are even completely the dominated by, by women. And there is never any expressed concern about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and something you talk about, and I've talked about too, but it's, you know, it, it, generally now in most universities, it's, it's, it's now well over 60% of the undergraduate yeah. population is female, about 40% male, but in, in many disciplines, including it's, you know, I'm a physicist and I hear about the policy of women in STEM, but in, in a huge number of STEM disciplines they are by far the majority in biology, for example, mm -hmm. And um, yeah. but one only hears about the the disciplines uh, where they where for some reason the demographics is such that they're not in the majority. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, the you you what was it? Well, actually, before we get to the details, you 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 your talks were protested. How do your how did your colleagues respond at all in in literature in in the university or elsewhere? If you want to talk about it, you don't have to. Yeah, I don't know. I, they, you know, by that point, I was already, you know, I think I'd made it clear and it only takes, you know, one comment said in yeah. a department meeting and everybody knows, uh oh, she's not one of us. Okay. And so by that point, I think it was already pretty clear that I was, uh, you know, a non-believer. Okay. And, and so, uh, um, and, you know, and, and uh, I, my colleagues were very nice to me. They're very civil people. And I did have a few friends, but um, I think I, I would have to say that I was essentially very nicely frozen out. They must have known. I, I didn't, you know, tell anybody. <laughs> I didn't send her out a mass email saying, yeah. hey, look, I did yeah. this talk at the U of T. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, obviously they would have seen it and, and been appalled. And But they were nice enough not to say anything. And, and no, you know, nobody came. You didn't to have my a conversation. That, my... there, were no, there were no conversations about the intellectual content of that or, or, or the whole issue? Or were there no seminars or? And, oh, um... What do you mean? I mean, um, I'm on, on the issues you raised. I mean, on the issues raised in your public talk and, and fe the history of feminism and and uh, um, and uh, and the claim and the treatment of man. But there was no, no, there, no. no, no. I mean, in the, in that last year when I told you we did the um, the program review, and I I was responsible for writing um, writing up part of the our our self-report document and I did actually comment on the paucity of male students and I said because we were always concerned yeah, sure. with keeping student enrollment up yeah uh, and I said you know one one really quick and easy way we could increase our enrollment would be to make our classes um, more attractive to men and maybe we should have a conversation about how that might be done and whether that you know um could be done partly by changing the ideological approach of most English literature courses, but that just gets frosted out. It just it is never it's never picked up. Do it made did it make it into the final report at least? Yes, uh, oh, yeah, good. it's there. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But but yeah, it would never be actually flagged or yeah. or focused on. When I when I I I I quit, can't help but asking when I heard that you had taken early retirement, uh, I wondered whether um, it, why, <laughs> other than perhaps it was financially attractive because of the university. But did did you were you incur, did you leave academia for the same reason a lot of people are leave academia lately, which is that it's just becoming 
impossible to be involved in open scholarship and discussion or yeah it- exactly for that reason i started to feel nervous while i was teaching i did think that it was only a matter of time before there would be a student complaint and uh you know what happens after that then then you get forced out and it's very very humiliating and horrible so uh, yeah i was i was always nervous even just be, you know giving basic information uh about the authors we were studying um yeah I, so I, I it just became so uncomfortable and so from the time i was in my early 50s i started thinking if if i can go at 55 I will. And, and so I did. And, you know, the fact that my mother was here in Vancouver, where we've moved to uh, after my dad died, I, I, um, I, I thought I would like to live in the same city as my mother. So my husband and I were kind of thinking along those lines, too. That's nice. It's nice that you're both able to do that and both able to move. Did you did you think it, you didn't feel protected by the fact you're a woman? You, I mean, I assume if yes. you had been a man, you would have been already forced out. Well, oh, yes. Yeah, I would have been gone probably after that first talk, you know, or or shortly after. Definitely. I, I had my female privilege and uh, it allowed me to say a lot of things that no man would have been able to say. And it was a lot more difficult to make pro- problems for me because you can't. It's not as easy for a female student to say that she was sexually harassed or that I had created a toxic environment or whatever. Yes, I was definitely lucky in that way. Yeah, no, I, I think that's one of the important reasons. I, you know, one of the reasons actually, interestingly enough, in the, the program we were going to have, and, and we may still have an Origins Foundation, was, a, was an all-female panel about these issues. Yeah. I, I assume there would have been no protests that there were no men on it, but, 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 in, <laughs> but in any case. Um, but yeah. I think it's, it's, it's important to see that because people automatically... Um, you, you are allowed to say um, things that, that, that men couldn't, and, but it's oh, important yeah. that they be said. And, and it's important we all have that discussion. And I want to, what I'm going to do, even though I like history and I know you like history, is I'm going to be very ahistorical. I want to I I start by talking about a recent piece of yours, actually came out August 10th uh, now, and then go back in time, back to, to, um, to uh, the early times. But actually, I wonder whether I want to put it. Yeah, before I get there, you point out you started to do the videos, the videos from which actually I first learned about you, the Fiamengo files, beautiful set of videos. When, when you look up now, you see that the original videos aren't there. It, you want to mm-hmm. explain to me what happened? Yeah, well, eventually, uh, I think it was last summer around this time, the, the entire channel, uh, which was called Studio Brule, that's my collaborator, Steve Brule, who did all the production of the videos. Uh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was permanently banned. And we'd been, um, you know, obviously on YouTube's <laughs> not approved list for some time. All, all of the videos were eventually demonetized. And then there were individual bans on certain videos, you know, for very, they never tell you exactly why. Mm-hmm. They just say that you contravene their community standards and things like that. And, and then eventually there was just the complete ban. So they are now on Odyssey, although I find them, Kind of hard to, to to find and and all all of the view numbers of course and all of the comments too are gone and that that yeah. latter thing is so, so I, I just i you know it's so sad because they the comment section especially on some of them they, it was a sight to behold they were there were hundreds and hundreds in some cases thousands of really interesting conversations often very civil debates and exchanges of views and it's really sad that that they're, they're, that's all gone but yeah that's that's what happened but um um steve and i have have started up again now we're starting over mm-hmm. again with a very small channel called studio b yes yeah, on b, youtube yeah. again and and people have said that's a very bad idea to go back to youtube which yes, oh. I can see why it is, but no, uh, YouTube idea. is still, it's still kind of the place to be. And uh, so we're there at Studio B. Okay. I would encourage anybody who wants to see um, what's going on in my new project to, to take a look there. I, I, there are a, a number of Studio Bs, so it's sort of hard to find, mm-hmm. but if you put Studio B Fiamengo into uh, Google search, you should be able to find it. And or we're now doing- fi- or even the Fiamengo file, which is, I think, how I found it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Um, it's the Fiamengo file 2.0 0. now, but, and yeah, yeah, so we're we're doing a series on the history of 
of feminism. Which is what I want to get get back to that history, mm -hmm. and that's how we'll end. We'll get there eventually. Actually, okay. the good news, I'm not, you should, must be aware. The good news is that there's Fear Mango File too, but it, but somehow three uh, um, uh, Fear Mango File originals are still on. Uh, episode one, episode six, and episode three somehow mm -hmm. survived, and they're still on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Maybe they're on somebody else's no, they're on, channel. No, no, no. It's Studio B. One of the channels is the original F Fiamengo file, just so you know. And maybe oh. I should announce it because maybe it'll give <laughs> ammunition to remove it. But, the, right. but, yes. there's, but they're there. They're there. Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah, Steve did remount some of the originals. He was uh, thinking, uh, um, I think originally he was thinking that he would put up the ones that we thought were the most important, but then we ended up just getting into the 2.0. But yes, they, there are still some of those very old ones from way back in 2015 there. The first yeah. episode, which is very important, which is why I'm, a, I'm an anti-feminist, which I want to some selves get mm -hmm. to, um, is, is up, is still up. And it's, a, it's right. very important, but it's always a shame. And not only when YouTube does it, but I know universities, including my own university, just take down videos where yeah. there's which are for which there's lots of not only public comments but there's resources and 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 uh and references and learning tools and teaching tools and they take it down as and and pretend they're interested in teaching it was really it's really yeah. uh, it's really, i know uh, it's, it's so it's so incredible i remember when um remember when alessandro strumia yeah did his uh, lecture at cern uh you know which um of course, was immediately taken down yeah. from from the CERN website, so that people couldn't even go. They just had to read about how what he had said was absolutely indefensible and yeah. unacceptable. But you couldn't even go and find right. out what he'd said in yeah. order to test it's his it, 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 hypothesis. Decide for yourself. Or, yeah, yeah exactly. decide for yourself, or look at the evidence that he had provided, or anything. I mean, I just find it it just extraordinary that these people can claim to be in any way interested in education, public knowledge, research, when, you know, debate, certainly mm. not, you know, when they do these kinds of things. Yeah, it, 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 it is. And you can imagine certain emotional groups, but when it, when, when academic groups start doing it, it you know, it seems like, and, and, the, and, the, and we're going ahead again, but the whole, the whole rationale is that somehow the facts hurt. Mm -hmm. If the facts hurt, the facts should never be discussed. Yeah. Because and 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 it's incredible. And, yeah, that uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, that that facts or arguments are a form of violence. You know, that started to be the 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 dominant yeah. claim. I don't know how long ago, fifteen years ago, perhaps became you know really popular about ten years ago to shut down anything that uh, these groups didn't like, and it, it's just yeah, it's incredible. It's so ridiculous so facile on its face and yet it has enormous power both within and outside of academia to prevent people from exploring all sorts of subjects yeah. that have uh, you know great public import i wonder if you'd be allowed in the english department now to talk about the childhood nursery rhyme that we used to say when i was in the playground when i was a young boy and or and listen to and and young girls said it as well, which was sticks and stones will break my bones, mm -hmm. but but we're, names will never yeah. hurt me. Yeah, and now no, names know, will it's, definitely hurt. Yeah, it's absolutely opposite. And and so anything, you know, uh, I mean, it it isn't like I don't think they really believe those things. Yeah, I don't think the people claiming to be hurt. Yeah, are really hurt. I mean, it, it's just a very convenient piece of rhetoric. It's a pure power play. It's about who gets to decide what's acceptable and what's not. It's about whose feelings matter. It's about which victim group, uh, you know, can excoriate which other so-called privileged group. Although obviously they're demonstrating that they're mm -hmm. not really a disempowered yeah. group at all if they have that kind of power, but you know, those contradictions don't stop them. And so yeah, it's just a way of, of demonstrating that certain groups of people uh, have got to face the facts that they are no longer able to speak honestly about a whole range of subjects in, in any kind of public forum anymore. And the people who are, who are not able to do that are the people who are supposedly been, we've been told have the power. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and, you know, that I, and to date this, and as you know, I, I recently wrote a piece saying that that part of the problem is that, is if you let, I don't think, I, I don't know if I use the word spoiled children in the piece, but people yeah. behave like spoiled children and or academia is a lot. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and academia is allowing that to happen without yeah. with, with with impunity. Yeah. Um, 
then that's going to continue. And until someone says, says, stands up and some institution leader, and, and you can understand, have, have, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to me when I've talked about this. You get barraged immediately. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. You can understand. It's not as if people are cowards. It's, it's awful if you, it, when people speak up and, and then are just attacked. Yes. Speaking up. So you can see why academics have become afraid, but mm -hmm. somehow we'll talk at the end about what we can do. But let's go. Let's let, this is your chance and not mine. So as, as some people are immediately going to write in the comments section of this, oh, uh, uh, you know, okay. let, let her speak. Um, <laughs> but uh, so um, your mo this piece that I just picked up most recently, men have been psychologically abused by feminist ideology for decades. In some sense, it's a review of some of the history from from your discussion yeah. but but i you it, it came in the context of a of a <laughs> i can't believe it i could believe of a, of a tv program i guess when when um the in the uk in the election one of the the, the liz truss i guess is, has said that she's going to make um cat calling illegal and 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 um, cat calling wolf whistles and down blousing which i'd never heard of which is apparently photographing a woman's cleavage um which that would be illegal. Uh, of course, you know, you wouldn't want to, I guess the whole Grammy Awards would not be possible. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but but if you suggest that maybe women shouldn't bear their cleavage <laughs> in the way they do, yeah. oh, that's a terrible yeah, sexist was, thing to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. In any case, but but in the context of that, you talked about the debate that happened. And 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 I want to just quote some of the numbers because it's the UK numbers. But but um, basically, you're saying, look, um, it, not only is the legislation, of course, divisive and insulting to men, as you point out, it's it's also state overreach. But um, the people, you're, one of the points you've raised often is that, the, is that they ignore, and feminism in particular, ignores the difficulties of, of, of young men and males and uh, who are supposedly so privileged. And you talk about in the context of history. But here are the statistics in the UK. 75% of suicides in the United Kingdom are committed by men. Um, uh, men are 95% of the prison population, 85% of the homeless rough sleepers, and 77% of alcoholics. Workplace deaths in the United Kingdom are 94% male. Boys are performing far worse than girls in the UK and primary systems. At the tertiary level, young men are outnumbered by women at, at close to two to one. And, and as you point out, wouldn't you think feminists might spend a few days at least pretending to care about men's issues? Not in your life, they continue to hammer away at male entitlement. So those are some of the statistics that, but may, but, but, I'll let, but I'll let you elaborate because it's a nice article on, on sort of where to go from there. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, and the, the statistics, by the way, are for North America, of course, are pretty much identical, identical. or even worse. Yeah. I think uh, men are 80% of suicides in the United States and they're 97% of workplace deaths and, and yeah, 96% perhaps of the prison population, yet we still have these programs for uh, keep, how to keep women out of prison. Um, nothing about how to keep men out of prison. I, you know, we just, yeah, it, it, it's just um, like the glaring contradictions don't seem to phase feminist ideologues or even the general public. And I think that that's the thing that I find so um so frustrating at times is that wh wherever you are on the political spectrum, I know there are leftist men who don't consider themselves feminists. There are certainly many conservative men who don't consider themselves feminist. And yet most of them, to some degree or other, often to a large degree, accept the feminist claims and yeah. feel compelled to express uh, concern, you know, about the paucity of women in STEM, or concern about the problem of sexual harassment, or concern, you know, or, or their, you know, how, um, how horrific it is that women have to walk down the street and face cat calling and wolf whistling, and, and yet are uh, either don't know about the, the, the reality of how boys and men are falling behind or struggling or, or even don't care. I mean, and that is the problem is that, that feminist ideology has, has ridden high on a deep, um, well, we use the term gynocentrism in men's issues mm -hmm. circles, but just a, just a deep, 
preference for women, both men and women find it hard to care as much about the struggles that men face. That this has been amply psychologic, you know, documented by um, experts in psychology. There's a woman named Alice Eagley, who's done a lot of research on this and Antonio Mladenic and various yeah. others, uh, Roy Baumeister as well. And they just keep finding over and over again that women have an in-group bias. Women tend to care more about other women. They have a strong sense of, of their of belonging to that, that group, womanhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and men have a strong bias towards women. And so when women say that something is hurting them or something needs to be done to support women, men tend to be willing to jump and do it. Whereas when men complain or raise issues that are affecting boys in our society, mm -hmm. everybody gives the collective yawn. And, uh, and that's how feminist ideologues have been able to get away with decades upon decades of programs to advantage women, which have disadvantaged men. And it's why we're not very interested now in, in doing, doing anything about the asymmetry that has resulted. Yeah, no, in fact, um, the, uh, when I first began to sort of think and question this as I was a chairman of a physics department, you know, when I was told that, that, that people were insensitive to women's issues, I, I looked all around, it was, it was quite the opposite. Because most of us, uh, when I first heard, you know, I looked at the policy of women in physics, and we tried to do something about it. It's a natural thing to want to do to, to help, and 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 we instituted programs, and and um, and uh, and you know, when I was chair, we we hired the first women in physics, and we even uh, uh, got a first all female class to matriculate in in at least the, of offers in graduate school. And I didn't think twice about that because it, it, it is true that it seems natural to try and assist in those things when you've grown up and, and heard about the problems but then you look around and say well but there are all these programs that are help working why why are we systemic what are where are the systemic inequities mm -hmm. um there are where are the and 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 one of the things that you broke broke me up when i was reading is you talk about the that we need to do uh, 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 this would be a wonderful speech to begin with we need which might get you in the door but then kicked out very quickly afterwards but we need to do something about the sy systemic inequities in universities and get applaud mm -hmm. the systemic inequities against men and, mm -hmm. and 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 that would really which is what you said do you want to com comment on that i mean i was pleased i was amazed actually I, I guess i've given away that i was pleased but but i was uh the the uh to see you use those terms because it's so unusual i'd never seen anyone talk about systemic inequities you hear the president of the united states you hear the head of the national academy of sciences the head of the national institute of health the heads of the all the major scientific organizations talk about systemic inequities against mm -hmm. women and minorities um yeah but That's never the other way around. not yeah. not not against men certainly not against white men and uh, you know i've spent years now like putting things up on twitter about yet another round of women only appointments mm -hmm. at you know some various universities and i always get comments by um, both men and women but certainly by men saying oh big deal you know oh so what so that here's you know for for one year some men are going to be discriminated against boo hoo and I try to tell them, well, actually, this has been going on, and you know, you can you can read about it. There's a book called um, uh, uh, it's by Martin Loney. It's called um, In Pursuit of Division: um, Race, Gender, and Equity Hiring in Canada. He wrote it in the '90s, and wow. it documents the beginning of all of this in the late 1970s and 1980s. He was writing as as a, not exactly a socialist, but cer certainly a left-leaning person interested in social justice and all this. And he was saying, mm. you know, this is not the way to go. And, um, and he used all, he had all the statistics showing that in fact, like you just, you can't break down um, issues in these very binary simplistic terms because it simply isn't the case. If you're looking at income level, you know, you'll find immigrants from, Greece and Portugal, right in there with immigrants from Jamaica, 
in terms of their income level. So you can't say that all whites have privilege and all blacks don't, mm -hmm. you know, that all those kinds of things. And, you know, he really gets into it and he provides the same kind of very meticulous analysis of the position of women, um, you know, over those decades. And um, so, so this is something that has been entrenched in academia and elsewhere in the society for decades. I mean, I find it breathtaking that, that this is what men have had to endure and yet still feel ashamed for their alleged privilege that at least two generations of men have been discriminated against in hiring overtly, legally, that there have been positions either held only for women or at least, you know, where, yeah, men could apply, but they weren't going to be even given a serious look at if there were any women who were even close to similarly qualified. I saw that myself yeah, sure. with my own eyes at the University of Saskatchewan year after year, starting in 1999. So I've seen it personally for over 20 years. I mean, I just, if I were a man, I would, I, I mean, I would feel really angry about it and yeah, and i think don't. we you know but yeah, yeah but they don't and and no, i mean i think we should be men and 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 non-feminist women should be marching in the streets and saying no more no more discrimination let's live in a culture let's live in in, in societies where people have equal opportunities to bring their gifts to the world and to pursue their ambitions and their talents and that's an end of it. Let's stop this. I mean, I just find it outrageous. And and you know, and and if you talk about this, and you, you know, the source of male anger, most men aren't angry, and the vast, vast, vast majority of men just want to say, okay, let's just let's call it quits now. Let's start over again. The vast majority of men just want to live in harmony with women, and they want to to form partnerships and they wanna to work together and build a good society together. And there's so many women who are still angry about their issues and not at all interested in listening to what men have to say. I've given talks where at the end of the talk, after I went through all of the statistics, some of which you read, mm -hmm. a woman will stand up at the end and say, I mean, I'm thinking of a particular example, and give an anecdote about something that happened to her in 1988, where some man made a sexist comment and mm -hmm. everybody will applaud. Yeah. And the clear implication of her comment is, this happened to me 35 years ago. I'm still angry about it. And I'm not interested in hearing about 80% of suicides being male. I don't mm -hmm. give a damn about men dropping out of, you know, the school system. I don't give a damn about any of those things because I'm holding on to my grievance. My victimology matters more than anything else. And people will applaud that. And I'm and I said to this woman, I'm not interested in collective vengeance seeking. I don't think even if it were true that men up until 30 years ago had exercised absolute dominance and subjugation of women. Why should the younger generation of men have to pay for that in their own lives? I don't believe in that. That's the, that's the way to guarantee deep social dysfunction. And it isn't even true. And that's what I've discovered in my research. It is not true that yeah, that's well, what men did to women 50 yeah. years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Feminism was always built on lies. And it was always built on the social preference that we have for women and the great concern and compassion that men have for women. And so um, I think I got off topic there, but you know, no, that, it's all right. I'm enjoying listening to it. <laughs> but, but that, you know, that's the difficulty. It is, it is, it is that people forget that, that the, the kinds of um, ameliorative policies that various universities are putting forward now that they've already been tried they've been in place for for decades for decades i mean i'll you know i i, I want to come back actually I, I well you actually again as usual anticipated where we're going which is the history of feminism and we'll get there but um yeah when i talked about my experience as chair i'm talking about the 1990s yeah I'm talking about the fact that that um 
that when whenever we hired anyone, and that was nineteen early nineteen nineties, yeah. if we didn't hire a woman, we had to write a special yes. letter to the administration explaining why we didn't hire women. That was nineteen nineties. That's thirty yeah. years ago. So that was it. Was I know well where and when I was at the University of Saskatchewan, starting in the late nineties, and at the University of mm. Ottawa, it was the same thing. Mm. If you didn't hire a woman or somebody else yeah, in another yeah, equity I, group, I, I, yeah, uh, you know there were the various groups: the indigenous yeah. and people mm. of color and the disabled. Mm. Uh, you had to write, if you wrote, hired a white man, you had to write and explain why. And so that it's been going on all these years. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is really extraordinary. Now you, um, it's, um, it, it, it is extraordinary. And it's a little more, as you, as listeners will know, I, or viewers, I've moved back to Canada and, and I was kind of amazed, um, discover that actually this discrimination can be explicit in Canada. It's implicit yeah. in the United States. I mean, you, where you, in the United States, you're not allowed to have an ad at a university saying only only available for women faculty positions, uh, men, you know, or women or mm -hmm. minorities are disabled. Um, in Canada, you can do that. And there and 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 I, I just wrote about one or two, you know, uh, major positions in physics, for example, that were only open and and um, and worse than that, the, the 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 advertisement said not only that it was only open to to women uh, some version of this women minorities and 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 other disadvantaged groups but in the in the in the application you had to show how you have worked to empower groups yes. that deserve equity mm -hmm. oh yeah <laughs> that, equity and, deserving yeah, and i and i thought how can is anyone equity not deserving i mean I is know. anyone I, that's that shocked it's me awful. but it was I mean, I it just, was allowed yeah, I, by the law to write that yeah. I know it's just horrible, isn't it? It used to be equity seeking groups yeah, yeah. for a long time. And then they changed it to equity deserving groups. Only certain groups deserve equity. I mean, it's right there. The bigotry is so blatant in everything that they write. And, and yeah, it is, it is somewhat uh, startling to, to know that that is part of Canadian law. It's right there in the Canadian charter of rights and freedoms that, that you have, um, everyone has the right to be treated equally, except yeah. if what you're trying to do is correct for so-called historic, yeah. uh, you know, marginalization and, yeah. and inequalities in that once you're, you can make that claim, all bets are off bets and, are. and nobody has a right, no man has a right to be treated equally anymore. Do, just, just out of a point of information, is there a discussion anywhere of of what equi equity deserving means. I mean, it was the first time I'd seen it. Is there, do people write specifically what that implies? I mean, is there, is there a legal or any? I'm sure you, there academic? is. I don't okay. know. You know, I don't know. I never looked, but, but I'm sure it's defined and, you know, it would be defined in exactly the way that it's always been defined. Yeah. It would be women and people of color and yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Now, now yeah, again, you know, not only am I going a historically in terms of history of feminism, I'm going a historically in what I plan to talk to you about. But you brought up so many interesting points in the last discussion. In particular, you point out how the how the how um, men who um, are uh, not only have bought in, you know, are particularly sympathetic to these issues because they've been told their whole lives. But you talk, uh, uh, interestingly enough, about even people who point out the problems with that, um, the fallacies of some of that, uh, those arguments, inevitably I implicitly buy into them. You wrote an article saying accused men on campus are up against decades of feminist myth, make myth making, but you, but what, um, what fascinated me was that you quoted Stuart Taylor Jr. Jr. give a warning to parents about oh, yeah. how difficult it is for their sons. And, and, and when you, it's one of those things you read on the surface, you go, yeah, 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 yeah. But then you parse it, which is a wonderful thing for a, <laughs> a professor of literature to do. So let's let me give the quote, and then let me let I'll let you parse each. each <laughs> well, I don't know if show. I can remember what well, I said. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you the quote, and then you. Well, okay, we'll see. This will be a good test. It's, so the quote from him is, "You should, of course, treat women with respect." <laughs> Avoid Stop. making un okay, okay, okay. Hold on, we'll go through each of those words because I think you'll remember once I give you the sense. Okay, you should, of course, treat women with respect. Avoid making unwanted sexual overtures and be quick to help the victim of an apparent assault, sexual or otherwise. What be what may be less obvious is that just as women in college face grave dangers from rapists and other sexual predators, men like you face grave dangers from false accusers 
and 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 you go on but 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 what amazes me you say okay you read that and you go good he's 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 pointing this out but then you point out each of those claims is itself not true so let's go you should yeah. let me why, let's... why should you treat women with respect i mean i agree that we should approach every individual we meet with you know uh the intent of being civil i don't know about respectful exactly but certainly civil and polite uh, why should men respect women? Are women ever hectored to respect men? No, of course not. Uh, and and if if women were like if 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 we want to make that our uh, cultural bedrock that each sex treats the other with respect, okay, that's fine. But of course, that's not true. Um, women do not respect men, and men shouldn't have to respect women if the women aren't behaving with respect. And the well, implication there, of course, is that a special standard is required for women. And there's also a kind of female moral supremacism built into that, which is that somehow women are more worthy of respect than those disgusting, dirty, you know, horrible men. So yeah, I reject that right, right from the outset. It's, it's all part of that. We should believe women, you know, we, we have to protect women. Well, why? If they're, if they're liars, if, if they act uh, dishonestly, aggressively, shamefully, uh, then I don't respect them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I guess I, I, I'd give him a little leeway. I think you don't need to respect people. Some people aren't deserving respect, but treat people with respect. I think it just, just means mean means courteously, civilly, and that mm -hmm. I'm all in favor of. And absolutely, and the people who are idiots, you might as well treat them at least courteously and civilly with and with kindness, because there's. Oh, I know, agree. No, yeah, I yeah. agree. But it's the implication that men don't treat women with respect to begin with, and that women yeah. are uniquely deserving yeah. of respect while men aren't. That really bugs me. Okay, second sentence. Poor second guy. He's, he was trying so hard and you just destroy him. Anyway, not really destroy him, but the language. No. Second, is, the parsing is really interesting. The second cl claim, which sounds reasonable, but then of course you argue against, avoid making unwanted sexual overtures. Yeah. Your turn. Come on. Yeah, what does that mean? Unwanted? I mean, come on, how, how is the guy to know? We still live in, in human communities where men make the vast majority of romantic and sexual advances. That's just... I think that's human nature. If you want to argue that's just learned, okay, yeah. fine. It still is. Most women do not make the first move. So how is the man to know whether the sexual overture uh, is wanted or not? I mean, this is the whole problem with sexual harassment legislation. It says that anything that's unwanted falls into the category of sexual harassment. So if a man asks a woman out for a date and she says, oh, gee, I'm busy that night and then he asks her again not realizing that oh i'm busy actually meant you know bug yeah, off kind of, pre, yeah. but she couldn't say it because that's how women often are mm -hmm. uh then he's now guilty of of uh an unwanted advance so you know that's that's just you see i'm a, I'm a scientist and it seems to me maybe a quaint notion that to find that that you base your presumptions on empirical evidence mm -hmm. so it's hard in this case it would be hard to know um what was unwanted unless uh, w without any empirical evidence <laughs> exactly and, and, yeah. and one of the ways would be to 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 ask someone out or something like that and then you might find get some evidence but okay and you know and this is a this this whole idea of the unwanted advance it, it has built into it a a privileging of a certain type of man who is very very attractive to women his advance is not going to tend to be unwanted yeah. but the nerdy guy who has spent all of his life let's say you know reading about astronomy uh and doesn't have that much experience with women but uh you know still really <laughs> likes women mm -hmm. and the only women he's ever going to meet are, are are the women uh either in his classes that he's taking mm -hmm. at university or if he goes on later maybe women in his lab or you know whatever yeah. it happens to be um what so what is he is he supposed to live as a monk is he not even allowed now to make an advance without that being somehow uh considered unacceptable even by a guy who has spent his life writing about the injustices to accused men on university campuses even he's bought into the rhetoric yeah yeah exactly and 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 another issue which i which i guess i, I credit my wife with teaching me about because she's a woman and attractive women as she i think she is um uh um learn she said you know you learn how, how to kindly and gently say no but it's not a 
it's not traumatic. It's I mean, every, it's something you it's something mothers or fathers teach young girls is how to w women are going to be a, you're going to be you're going to be uh, a, uh, someone's going to ask you out and you may not want to do that and how to do and how to how to do it kindly or if if the if the proposition is is rude and how to say buzz off and just go away and not feel like you've been um, traumatized for the rest of your life. It's just a, it's just mm -hmm. part of becoming an adult. And, yeah, and, and similarly it is, for it men. It's very difficult, you know, quite frankly, it, it, it's quite difficult, it's difficult for the woman to say no. Often she doesn't want to yeah, hurt the guy's feelings. Exactly. It's you very know. difficult. It, it it's, can't, it's very difficult to say, I just don't find you attractive, attractive. at all. And I yeah. never could, you know, yeah. it, that's awful. And so, so lots of women don't want to say that. And so, and the guy, I mean, what, what have guys been taught? Even now in our feminist approved culture, the idea of the masculine hero um, he, the most chivalric hero, he, 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 he tries, he wins the woman, you know, that's what he does. And maybe he does great exploits. Mm -hmm. He defeats the, you know, evil in his town, or he does something wonderful. And he does those things for the girl he loves who maybe wasn't interested in him at first, but now she is because she sees what a wonderful man he is. I mean, I think that's still a, an admirable romantic paradigm, but what that means is that the guy is often primed not to take no for an answer, at least not the first time. And, and who can blame him? Like lots yeah. of guys have said to me, you know, if I had taken no for an answer, I would never have married the woman that I love. Well, it's because... actually the basis of speaking in literature person. Someone pointed out this out to me. It's the it's the basis of essentially every romantic comedy. It is. Boy exactly. asks girls out, she says no. Boy asks yeah. girls out, she says no. You know, finally boy asks girls out, she said yes. You know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. the basic, the basic. Uh, and and yeah. and the other part of this, and you know, I wasn't going to talk about this because it's because I'm a man. I mean, I'm not supposed to. But again, my wife has has pointed this out. It's not. Of course, it's difficult for a woman to turn someone down gracefully. It's a hard thing to do, and it and you can damage people by you know. Can you can yeah. imagine how bad you feel if you say no, you're not attractive to me. I'd never go out with you. It, but if you're a man, it's also put. You, it, you, it's it's very difficult to ask a woman out. I, I yeah. mean, I certainly was afraid to in high school because, you know, you get rejected. It's really difficult. It really oh, is deflating, and it's it's a it's a this whole on both sides. It's a whole this interpersonal relationship is difficult and complex, and to boil it down to such a facile statement of 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 avoiding making unwanted sexual overtures is is to is to demean both men and women yeah i absolutely agree and and i you know and the, and the fact that you know when i said it's hard for the woman to say no uh i think it's much harder to be the man who has to keep asking and and being turned down all the time wow i mean that that's incredible that's that's really hard and the fact that the feminist movement has has I cast all of that into the realm of, you know, male predation on mm. women. And, and that supposedly the only thing we're supposed to care about is women's alleged feelings of fear and apprehension when they're having these unwanted advances. Again, it's just so, so lacking in compassion and humanity. Well, you know, but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep parsing. But now you reminded me of something else I want to get to you later. So I might as well get to you now. Two things you said w when you talk about being an anti-feminist, and we'll eventually get to the definition of anti-feminist <laughs> in a second. But um, I told you we're working backwards. Is you you say two things that are really quite provocative, or or at least would be seem quite provocative in our current world. One of them is you so talk about m seeking equality for women, and you say men and women aren't equal. So you want to expand upon that? Well, they aren't. And, and it's really interesting to see feminists now talking about that. The TERFs, you know, the uh, gender critical feminists, as they call themselves, mm -hmm. who have split from the social constructionist feminists. For many, many years, we were told that everything was a social construction, every mm -hmm. behavior, even physical strength. I have read articles and I've written about them that claimed that physical strength itself was socially constructed from everything from what women are expected to do and allowed to do physically to the the, uh, the amount of food, um, you know, the, the amount of protein that parents tend to give girls yeah. as opposed to boys, you know, all that crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and, but you know, now it's coming out. Yes, okay, I mean, if that were true, then we would just open all sports competitions 
to everybody. Why well, have women's sports teams and men's sports teams? Now with the trans issue, of course, a lot of angry women are coming forward and saying, hey, this isn't fair. Now women are being prevented from competing with other women and women aren't as strong as men. So, so there's that. And you know, there's so many other differences. There's so many psychological differences. Women and men have different interests. They have different aptitudes. And we simply have to recognize that. And although there are individual uh, di differences, I mean, there are individual exceptions, I should say, some women are taller than some men, you know, that kind of thing. But in general, men are taller than women. Yeah, so, no and, you know, and, and, and let's, you know, like there's so many, when a man and woman are lying in bed at night and all of a sudden there's a loud noise right around the front door. Okay, I admit that maybe in one or two percent of households, it's the woman who goes down mm. to investigate. But I think in the vast majority of households, it's the man who goes down to investigate. And it's the man who kills the spider in the bathtub and, you know, all these kinds of things. So, so, so this idea that equality is our new God and we're going to have to rearrange everything and force people into boxes mm. because we believe in equality... I just think that's a very bad postulate to begin well, with. Well, and the point is that what people don't realize is saying that people aren't equal is not a a, a judgment call. No. It's not. It's not a pejorative statement. It's not. It's not a value judgment because you know they're they're in they're in inequalities, but they're going. You know, it's not to say one is better than the other. It's men no. are taller than women. Maybe men are stronger than women. But it's mm -hmm. also true that women are socially more adept than men on the whole, socially more uh -huh. aware, which is mm -hmm. allows them, in fact, to sometimes manipulate situations and maybe <laughs> right. gives them an advantage, even when you think the power advantage is, is somewhere else. So it, it it's just the recognition that there are differences, but it's not to say that the fact that their differences makes one better than or, or worse than another. It's really, it's. Uh... I, and I've, I've not met very many men who are interested in talking about the general inferiority of, of women. Again, I, I keep right. coming back to this, but I've talked to so many men since I started doing this anti-feminist stuff who just, although they are very angry at feminist ideology, they still really love women. They love women's mm. bodies. They love women's minds. They love the way women are. Like they, they, you know, this notion of objectification. Oh, this is a mm -hmm. terrible thing. You know, men objectify women. What that really means is that men love, many men love women's bodies so much that they will actually allow themselves to be killed in order to protect those bodies, that they fantasize about those bodies, not just sexually yeah, per yeah. se, but, that, you know, they just, they're they're obsessed with with women. I mean, and this goes back, I'm sure, to the experience of the baby boy at his mother's breast, or even before that. His sense of her body is of this nurturing, enveloping, safe space. A girl has a very different relationship to her father. It is not the same thing, and so. Uh, you know, the, the, there just are all of these differences, and it has very little to do with men wanting to oppress women. I have met a lot of women who don't like men very much, I'm sorry to say, uh -huh. who have contempt for men, at best are indifferent to their needs or concerns, or even have a vengeful kind of satisfaction that they take in the thought of a man suffering. I've had conversations with women where they talk about how... I had one conversation with a woman who talked about how men suffering uh, kidney stones was a kind of revenge for the fact that men don't give birth and so therefore don't experience that pain that women experience. And she, she laughed at the idea, ha ha, finally, men were having to experience pain. I really have never met a man who took pleasure in the thought of a woman's pain during childbirth. Yeah. And in fact, the history of medicine has been the history of men trying to, medical men trying yeah. to cut down on the pain that women suffer during childbirth. So, you know, there are all of these inequities and um, I don't think male superiority over women is a problem that we face in our in our society. I, I just, I do not see it. Okay, well, I think we, we've gone over the men not equal women thing. I, although I will mm -hmm. say, just, you know, again, for full disclosure, that in, in um, we lived in Australia and these big spiders and it would be my it would be my wife who'd take care of them. <laughs> Just so you know. Anyway. Okay, there we go. But um the um or at least at the beginning. But um the uh 
The other thing you say, which of course it permeates a lot of this, but I want to get it out now, is you say that one of the big problems is that the feelings become more important than reality. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's related to the, I want to relate it to, since we're I'm still going into that parse, parsing that second unwanted sexual overtures, but the, the feeling of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of infringement on your personal space when someone may ask you out, um, it may lead to a feeling of, of you know, may, you, you feel badly and you may feel mm-hmm. in person French, but, but, um, but then that feeling becomes more important than the reality of someone having just gassed mm-hmm. you out in the office or, and yeah. so, but, but that's just one example. Do you want to go into it more? Because yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's a huge topic really. And, and it's difficult for me because I don't ever remember really having that that feel, you know, I never, I don't remember ever feeling threatened by men. And, mm-hmm. you know, it could be, I, I wasn't a particularly beautiful young woman. So maybe the experience of really beautiful young women who are constantly, you know, they can't walk down the street without mm-hmm. men turning their heads. And everything. maybe that's different. I've heard theories that, that especially women at, in certain ages, that mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of programmed almost to, um, to be very aware of, of that threat. Um, and that this has a kind of evolutionary mechanism, but, yeah. but, um, since I didn't like all the men I knew, and as I said, I grew up in a lower middle class, working class neighborhood. My, my friends and I used to go roller skating for fun, like from age 14 to 16, 17, we, we hung out with kind of rough boys. And, and yet my experience of young men was that in general, they were very gentlemanly overall Mm. definitely Mm. not interested at all in forcing a woman to do anything she didn't want to do or you know anything like that so um so i have trouble believing the claims of uh you know the damsel in Mm. distress kind of cries that Mm -hmm. we hear so often again i see them as power moves but even if they are true that is certainly no reason why i mean we have now a situation where men are being uh, fired from their jobs or disciplined for alleged sexual harassment for the most minor of missteps. You know, you can make a, a joke, you can stand too close, you can be accused as a man of having a, a gaze that is too intense. Um, you know, there are all sorts of very, very minor, I mean, now hugging. Yeah, we're, I, we're going to get shoulder. there. Let's get there. Hold off because we yeah. want to talk about your monster gaze thing, which I enjoyed listening to. But, <laughs> I but, mean, but, that, 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 those are all cases where even if I accept that the woman really did feel threatened by the man standing too close to her or giving her a yeah. pat on the shoulder, whatever it happens to be, to start making law and policy based on those exaggerated feelings or those hysterical, dare I say, feelings uh is is well it's just it's a recipe for injustice well let me let me for your sake uh, and mine but let me just clarify one thing it, it, that your experience has been a good one but but neither you nor i but in particular you since you made the statement do not deny there are cases of men um enforcing themselves on women it's not that it's not that you deny that doesn't happen it's just it, no the question, of course not yeah, you know, of i want to make that clear to the to, yeah. the, to the listeners I, 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 mu- I mean of course not but but i must say that um you know i i now like i read pretty well every uh, well people send me all sorts yeah. of yeah. Um, articles about this this complaint of sexual harassment mm. this complaint of sexual assault it's very difficult to find one where you say, ah, yeah, that there, you know, the yeah. guy was obviously guilty. In so many cases, they are murky at best. Um, so no, let, let's distinguish. I, I know I, that's we're going to get there. No, no, we're going to get there. I'm not talking about the sort of the, the alleged claims of places like workplace or campus. I mean, there are legal, there are people go to court because some people have raped people and people, and in sure. the legal system, this happens. It's not as mm-hmm. if it doesn't. We're, what you're referring to is the far vaguer area and campuses and workplaces, which, which, I, which I want to get to. But, uh, and, but before we get there, I want you to parse this last sentence, which will mm. get us there, um, which is, you say, where is, what may be less obvious is that just as women in college face grave dangers from rapists and other sexual predators, that yeah. statement you point out, as other yeah. people have, is complete false nonsense. I mean, he, he knows it i don't even know why he said that he's the one that br- brings out the statistics that that every reputable study has found that the danger that women face in society at large is certainly higher like women are safer 
on college campuses in North America than anywhere else. I mean, there were cases where universities didn't receive a single report of sexual assault, you know, in, in a year or two years. So these are places where, yeah, women are very safe. So I don't understand why it's always necessary to, because as soon as you, uh, um, as soon as you concede that ground, then you're already in a place where you're not, for one, you're not talking about reality anymore. Mm -hmm. And you're already back footed because you're going to have to agree that if college campuses are really such a dangerous place for women, then, you know, we're going to have to have all of these various policies to try to protect them or, or, or to try to expel men who did all these bad things that aren't happening on those college campuses. You know, I, 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 Heather McDonald, who who I've talked to and, and, and has different politics, I think, than probably both you and I, uh, but we agree on some things, has pointed out something very true. If that were really true, universities wouldn't be able to recruit students and parents. Yeah. If they if they were to say, you know what, 40% of the girls on our campus are raped, <laughs> yeah. they, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be the selling point of trying you know, to get in. They what, kind of, what kind of father would pay for his daughter's it's education? Because they're not. It's because it really happens that they're able to... to and, you, yeah. you know, and, and also to be frank about it, things happen on college campuses, but they are not that. They are not the man jumping yeah, out yeah. of a dark corner, forcing the woman, you know, and yeah. raping her. They are women going out and getting drunk. And men going and getting drunk too. And men getting drunk too. And then they go back to his dorm room and they have some fumbled sexual encounter of some sort. And the next morning she wakes up and she feels bad about it or she feels angry or she feels embarrassed. And then you end up with uh, some kind of complaint, not every time, of course, but, but sometimes. And, you know, I used to walk home from the University of Ottawa. I lived in the student area in the first few years mm -hmm. when, when I taught there. And the bars would just be crammed, mm -hmm. and, you know, all night. And I mean, for one thing, I always thought, wow, these, these are different <laughs> students from the type I was. They're not home <laughs> doing their homework. They're always telling me they don't have time to do their reading, but, you know, they're out at the bars every night. But, but also, like, if it were true that campus was such a dangerous place for women, then they would not be putting themselves in these vulnerable positions. They would not be drinking themselves into a stupor with guys they hardly know. And know, let's so. make it, let's make it, but let's even be clearer. Men wouldn't put themselves in that vulnerable position either, because right now they can wreck, I mean, most, most young men, I'm assuming in, in a campus realize that if they end up, if they're drunk and they end up in a sexual encounter, they're at risk now of, 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 of being expelled as much as anyone else. I think men, you know, and, and you know, and Heather, Heather's argument is you shouldn't allow kids to drink, and maybe that's a little bit different. Wow. Maybe, maybe, yeah. you should have, maybe instead, I think you and I would say maybe you should expect kids to uh, to begin to behave like adults and and accept responsibility for their behaviors. But both men and women, um, but so both sets, if if it were so, if it were so um, dangerous, would it wouldn't continue to to uh, to, to occur? In a, on campuses? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that for the men, um, I, I do think that young men are unwise to yeah. to involve themselves in these kinds of drunken encounters. Yeah. I think the... I agree. You know, I would I would certainly counsel them not to. I would counsel mm -hmm. them to have a girlfriend, to know her very well, mm -hmm. to romance yeah. her, you know, do all yeah. the traditional things and, and, you know, go that route. Even then, unfortunately, Even you're then. still not safe. Yeah. You know, there are many cases I've read about where they dated for years. Yeah. Me too. And in the end, she claimed that he had done something terrible to her. He had forced her in some way. So um, so it is very difficult for the men. But I again, I mean, I, I have, a, I guess, a little bit more sympathy for those guys, because I think a lot of those young men, they just want it so much. I mean, not just sex yeah. in, in a crude sense. They they really want the the intimacy. They want to have a girlfriend. And so this is the way they see that they can can have that. And they're just hoping that it's not going to happen to them. And uh, unfortunately, often it does. But um, yeah, for, for and I do, I feel for girls who, because those girls too have been duped, I think, in, in various ways. They've been told by the whole culture, uh, influenced by feminist ideology, that they are, you know, that that's part of their liberation. 
that girls should be just like guys. They, their attitude to sex mm -hmm. should be a casual one. You see that in the movies all the time. Girls, they take off their clothes. It's no big deal. It's an enjoyable thing. They're very mm -hmm. cool. They go off the next day. Usually the guy then thinks, wow, and he pursues her or whatever. Mm -hmm. In reality, it is that you wake up the next morning feeling bad mm -hmm. about yourself. Maybe the guys do too, but I know for sure the girls often, they they, they feel slutty. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the really interesting thing too, that feminists have always claimed that that's a social construction that has to do with societal attitudes. I think it's, it's deeper than that. Yeah. And the fact that girls still feel that says, tells us that all of the social constructionist talk and all the discourse about empowerment and, you know, sexual liberation and everything that it is not actually true, doesn't help girls to act like that. Well, yeah. I, and okay. So let's talk about campuses a bit and then I want to get off, but, but we're on it now. And I was going to talk about it and you've talked about, um, um, the, uh, what, what I want to, you've talked about what you view are various inequities and we can talk about that, but the, but the response now, just to give a sense, and you talk about, uh, Ohio state, I think it's in the context of maybe yeah. the monstrous gaze thing, but, but, um, you know, universities are enacting regulations that define harassment in a way that's so, difficult to say to say is harassment and yeah well, hold on my dog is harassing me right now. <laughs> my dog wants to be picked up so i just have to do a kiss there we go okay. He's bugging. so uh anyway um so you want to talk about ohio state well i i just remember it was one just one amongst yeah. oh no many. it's, it's it, no it different a, it, yeah. yeah it has this crazy harassment policy that that defines staring as well as hugging and and patting on the back as forms of harassment and so once you're there there you know there's almost nothing that therefore wouldn't fall under that category and and it would be almost impossible then for uh, how you know how could a young man defend himself against the charge of sexual harassment um yeah, yeah. it's it's you know, and even if we get to the you know, to the more serious, um, the idea that uh, any kind of sexual encounter, if the woman has been drinking, now mm -hmm. that can be sexual. That's automatically no consent. Or, yeah, she the can't is drunk. consent. Yeah. I mean, what? Wow! Given that many young women use alcohol precisely to give themselves permission to be sexual and to loosen their inhibitions or nervousness or whatever. Men too. Men too, of course. But for the man, it's never an excuse. No matter yeah. how drunk he is, that doesn't absolve him of responsibility. But as soon as she's had a single glass of wine or whatever, mm. she now no longer has to take responsibility for what she did. She by, by definition cannot consent. Now, of course, again, everybody would agree that a woman who is completely passed out yeah. is not capable of consenting yeah. but this is not what we're usually talking about we're usually talking about a young man and a young woman both quite drunk or a little bit drunk uh who maybe uh do things that they wouldn't have done if they were sober hard to say but yeah. suddenly she is not responsible and he's a villain i i just I find it outrageous. Again, what about equality then? What about women's moral agency? Feminin feminism always claims that feminism is about the radical idea that women are human, as if men never imagined that women were human in the past. Well, anti-feminism is the radical idea that women are adults. And yeah. therefore, they make their own decisions and are responsible for what they decide. Absolutely. Okay. We're almost on anti-feminism, by the way, but I can't, I can't, the, the, I, I, I can't, I, I don't want to leave this completely because the staring thing really, it yeah. really is. is it, I knew a man who, who was uh, disciplined at his university because two girls had complained that he had stared at them. They were in a, an office waiting to see, you know, the dean of something. Yeah. And he didn't even know what they were talking about. Maybe he was staring at them, you know, maybe he yeah. was thinking about something and his gaze just happened to yeah. go over in their direction. Maybe he was trying to remember whether he'd known one of them yeah. in yeah. high school. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no. yeah, I've been made uncomfortable by somebody staring at me. So I get up and move or yeah. I uh, or say stop something staring. to them. Yeah, or, you're, you, know, you respond like an adult. But, yeah. but the, what I want to point out is that now it's gone from campus. I, I was informed... Uh, 
by a TV producer uh, when we were talking about doing a show that Netflix, I think it is, has new rules on the set. You're not allowed to stare at anyone for more than four seconds wow. on the set. So how how you can have a conversation is is you have to is amazing to me. But that's one of the rules. The other one is that you're not allowed to exchange phone numbers, uh, um, which and which is amazing because I I do think most people, many people end up with their spouses from based on people they met at work at some level. It's where where do you where do you meet people, mm-hmm. and um, and yeah. so this this kind of notion that normal adult intercourse and by intercourse I mean social intercourse, is um, Forbidden. Stare, you know, if you're interested yeah. in someone, you're, you know, you're when you're having conversation with them, you're actually looking at them. And how you can tell the difference between that kind of stare and another stare is a, it, so that kind of notion that humans can't interact, yeah. that interaction itself is dangerous, that mm-hmm. normal interaction is dangerous, is such a sad idea. It's it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a more than anything, I find it tragic. It is. It's, it's, it's tragic. It's, it's, it's toxic it's, it's to toxic, to, of course, to, to, to good human relationships. And it's what makes me think that at some level, whether consciously or unconsciously, this whole project is intended to destroy human community. It's intended to destroy everything that is good between men and women. It's intended to break the pair bond between men and women, which is the foundation of a flourishing society. Um, and it, obviously it's intended to make men extremely uncomfortable in their own skins, their attack for the way they sit. Remember there was a big campaign about man spreading yeah, uh-huh. some time ago. You're not allowed to sit with your knees apart. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're, everything, the way men look at women, uh, a, a, a nice comment that a man might make, you know, hey, honey, you're looking beautiful. Well, maybe that's inappropriate, but a lot of women enjoy it. It might make their day. You know, it, it, everything a man says or does is now potentially, uh, if not criminal, at least, you know, somehow disreputable. And it's also, I think it ruins women too, because it teaches them to second guess everything that they experience. Uh, it gives some perhaps women who are disordered in their thinking, uh, a very dangerous kind of narcissistic pleasure in accusing and berating men. And it's just a, it's a recipe for, for social dysfunction. You know, which, you've, which you've argued that feminism is, but as we get about to get there, we, you, you basically say that that feeling of, before we leave campuses that young boys go in and they're told at the very beginning they experience classes generally are forced to have some classes where they said where they're told that they're responsible for the inequity that or and rape in society yeah. and pedophilia and that they're ultimately as you've written second class citizens in both rights financial aid special programs and support systems so in mm-hmm. some sense they're they're um they're already made to feel like they're they have an original sin just yes. for being male. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for being born male. And, it's and that's bit... why I have argued that feminism is a kind of religion, but it's mm-hmm. a religion that has no notion of an all forgiving God. It has no idea of redemption. You can confess your sins all you <laughs> want. You can you know. declare yourself uh, guilty, but you can't have your sins washed away because you just have to keep apologizing for being male. That original sin will stay there forever. It is really a, a, a gruesome, inverted version of, of Christianity, I think. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that regarding all the secular wokeness is that the difference between secular religion and regular religion is there's no there's no redemption. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm not religious, as you know, I'm an Ogil atheist, but at least, the, at least the conventional religions, most of them, not all of them, have this notion of redemption. Um, yeah, well, Christianity has has very strongly the idea yeah. that, that God loves people that, yeah. and that all have fallen short of yeah. the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone, you know, needs to seek forgiveness and redemption. But feminism doesn't have that. Women, yeah. which by the way, be- which by which by the way, I should point out that also bothers me just as much. By the way, but anyway, uh, the Christian at thing. least at <laughs> least at least it believes that you know each the line between good and evil goes yeah. through every human yeah. heart. Feminism does not believe that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no, I agree. And um, anyway, let's get there finally. Why are you so your first video? Why you said why am I an anti-feminist? We've sort of alluded it in many ways, but I want you to um. I basically you you argue what femi- several things that you claim feminism was never all about: equality, 
et cetera. So maybe you could talk about it a little bit. And then I want to talk about this new his- series of videos on the history of feminism, which, which, uh, which confront conventional wisdom. But first, why are you an anti-feminist? I should just mention, uh, Larry, that I just got a notice saying my internet connection is unstable, which is a very bad sign. So if okay. I if I blank out, um, you'll know it's something going on here on my well, end. As long as um, long as your internet connection doesn't later on sue you for for abuse, we're okay. Right, exactly. <laughs> Didn't consent to this long interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So why am I an anti-feminist? Well, be, just because feminism, I think you know, we have already alluded to it. I see feminism as the ultimate hypocrisy. I believe it is based on dishonesty and it is based on hatred. I really honestly believe that feminism is a hate movement. Its object is to stir up hatred against men and it is fueled by irrational hatred, uh, especially stoked by a belief in lies about the past, about the universal oppression of women by men. So that that's that's really my okay. Experience. And a lot of people would counter and say, "But hold on, feminism was just trying to counter the yes. fact that you know w- women d- couldn't vote, couldn't work, mm-hmm. etc." Is it was really yeah. it was really trying to uh, right wrongs? And and, yeah. and 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 what would your response be? My response is, unfortunately, that isn't the case. And this is now my big hobby horse, and it's why I would encourage anybody who has doubts about what I've said, what I am saying now, to to take a look at Studio B. I knew this before because I had read feminist history, but I didn't realize it as extensively as I know it now, having done this uh, dedicated research over the last six to eight months, and I'm continuing to do more, but uh, it was never a, a movement that was at all interested in equality. It was always angry. It always had the worst things to say about men. It castigated all men. It never acknowledged any area where men had made improvements to benefit women, uh, where men had sacrificed for women, where men had built societies that cherished women and made their lives better, where men had expressed concern for women. It denied all of that. And it, and the, you know the, the texts, that prove this are the foundational documents of what's called now first wave feminism. If you go back to Seneca Falls, which is kind of the first women's rights convention in New York state in 1848, they were already peddling anti-male hatred. The thesis of that document that was signed there which is called the Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled on the Declaration of Independence. And it was in a sense, women's Declaration of Independence. The thesis of that document is that the entire history of mankind is the history of repeated injuries and usurpation on the part of men toward women the object of which was to establish an absolute tyranny by man over woman. And then they they have all these points underneath where they Mm. attempt to prove this, including objectively false claims, such as that all colleges were closed to women. Not true. Mm. There were colleges specifically dedicated to giving women a very good education equivalent to men from very early in the 19th century. So and, and there are many other and we won't go into well, all well, of we, we can we can go a lot when we when you in your history, I'll just give some of the titles of some of the uh, we won't have time to go into them, but yeah. people can read them. First of all, never about equality. Feminism was never about equality. Feminism was about destroying the family. Um and you have it, and maybe well, I'd like to go into this one about the vote because it's another it's another sort of misperception mm-hmm. that women, you know, fe- women were not allowed to vote and and feminism was about getting the vote. It, it, it was, a, you say, it's, it was about the infantilization of men, uh, the victimhood craze in early feminism. So victimhood isn't a new, isn't a no. new thing, you'd argue. It goes back all. A pathological male um, sexuality in, mm-hmm. in feminism. Uh, how the future was female goes way back uh, yeah. in, in the history of women. How mm-hmm. 19th century women got away with murder. 
um, sexual insanity in women in the in the feminist movement. Yeah, so there's a lot of provocative titles there. Yeah, they seem provocative until you actually you know read the texts that I'm basing all those on, and it is startling. And for anybody who um, is interested in a, a primary document that that uh, actually um, makes some of the same arguments I'm making, there was a man, a journalist, uh, and a barrister. Mm -hmm. and a socialist, fascinating man named Ernest Belfort Bax. Yeah. He wrote many articles in the 1880s and then right up until the early 20th century, he published a number of books. One was called The Subjection, The Legal Subjection of Men. It was in response to John Stuart Mill's uh, long essay, The Subjection of Women, and another one called um, The Fraud of Feminism. And he talks about how even in the 19th century, when we imagine that women labored under all sorts of legal disabilities, that actually women had exemptions from certain crimes. They couldn't be prosecuted for certain crimes. They often were not prosecuted for, for example, the crime of infanticide because of the overwhelming sympathy of male jurors for women who killed their own children. Uh, a woman who murdered her husband he said almost was never charged with murder, would it, it be charged with a lesser charge of manslaughter if possible, or even exonerated if she made the plea that her husband had been abusive of her, very similar to you know, our current state. Mm -hmm. A man who murdered his wife could never claim that he had killed her because she was abusive towards mm -hmm. him, although he recorded many instances of horrific abuse that women had 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 done to their husbands. And you know, he he at that time said that that feminism had swept through British society, he, he was a Brit, swept through to such an extent that two contradictory and competing claims were both accepted as true. And this is so similar to the present time. One, any endeavor, any area of society where women were not equally represented with men, it was always a case of sexism. It's always because of sexism, because women were just as good as men at everything or better. That was one brand of feminism. But on the other hand, women required special consideration. Women were different from men. They were specially victimized. They required special privileges, special perquisites, special mm -hmm. protections. And if we, they weren't given those, that was an example of injustice to women. Of course, the two can't both be true, mm -hmm. but... We, you know, in our own society today, it is the same kind of thing. The insistence on equality is always coupled with the insistence that women deserve special perks and, and special policies, etc. So it was already going on. He saw it and he defended it in uh, with some pretty compelling examples and from his position as a barrister and uh, the legal cases that that he had looked at. So, um, yeah, it, it um, I mean, I've just been struck by the consistent representation on the part of these early feminists who are allegedly, um, you know, humane and uh, just wanted equality and just wanted to take up their responsibilities in society. I've been really struck by the deep anti-male animus of all of their pronouncements, the consistent pathologization of male sexuality, the uh, denigration of the family, as a fundamentally corrupt institution, an institution in which women were essentially prostituted to men. Many feminists made the claim that there was no difference between prostitution and the position of married women within the family, that both were equally subject to male sexual tyranny. Uh, the disregard for the position of children and for the well being of children is consistent throughout all of feminist rhetoric. Uh, the, the, they advocated free love with absolutely no consideration for children. They wanted divorce to be made much, much, um, you know, made much more accessible. They, of course, they still wanted women to be, be uh, supported by, by men. 
They wanted to make divorce easier for women and more difficult for men. They wanted uh, the laws changed to protect women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is the major proponent mm -hmm. of American feminism, she was the acknowledged leader of the feminist movement along with Susan B. Anthony in the second half of the 19th century. She wanted women to be able to divorce their husbands for, for drunkenness and for a whole host of reasons, but still wanted women to be able to be you know, um, supported by, by men's money. And um, yeah, it's, it's just really startling to see that the hatred and the unwillingness to admit that men in any way had their own issues or made sacrifices, even during war, there was, you know, women wanted the right to vote. Well, Never that's how I was going to, I was going to let that, um, you came right to where I was waiting. Cause I, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously you can talk about this and you do with, with, eloquence and depth and uh, in your in your many videos and we're not going to we're not going to go over them there no, no. but but just to give a sense no no but just to give a sense that one of the things is the misperception um and, and that there we have perceptions of of what of what purpose uh, um uh, was being asked for and one of the things i've always felt yeah the vote is a clear example women were asking for the right to vote and um and then you point out even that is a misconception that the right to vote i think in the, I forget, U.S. Academy of 1918 or something like that. Um, but at that time, many men couldn't vote. Um, yes. And, mm -hmm. and moreover, it was interesting that at the same time, of course, men were being conscripted to go to the World, World War I. So why don't you talk about that? Because mm -hmm. I found that well, discussion kind primary. of fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that, that one is, it's a glaring example of feminist hypocrisy. And the fact that no feminist today ever talks about that and that we all believe, I certainly did even when I was doing my PhD, we all believe that all men had the right to vote, you know, sort of from the beginning of time and no women ever did. And it was never that simple. There were always um, uh, property and financial considerations there were poll taxes and things that limited, even in the United States, men's access to the ballot. And especially yeah. in the United States, the vote, the privilege of the vote always brought with it the responsibility to defend one's country, even to the point of sacrificing one's life at a time of war. That was always understood. And yet that's never acknowledged by feminists. The other thing that's really shocking in the British and Canadian cases is that even at the point of World War I, 40% of British and Canadian men, working class men, didn't have the right to vote yeah. because of these um, property, property and, yeah. and income qualifications. And, and the thing about um, you know, all of this uh, romanticization of the suffragettes and their struggle, throughout the 19th century, there was a move to expand democracy incrementally. In the early 19th century, very, very few, a tiny percentage of men could vote in federal elections, national mm -hmm. elections. In 1832, it was expanded to about one in six adult men. In 1867, I believe, no, 1864, the second reform act, expanded the vote to a some percentage of urban working class men. In 1884, it was expanded again to some percentage of rural working class men. Always there were these property and income considerations. So the fact that that was never mentioned by the suffragettes and that they were willing to watch these young men who did not themselves have a vote go off and die or be maimed in the trenches of Europe and say nothing and still continue to insist that women were uniquely oppressed because they didn't have the rights they imagined men have. I mean, I, I just find that stunning. And at the same time, the very same women who in Britain, they were extremely violent. They set homes on fire. They firebombed post offices. They had arson campaigns. They, I mean, there, there were fires burning for years across Britain in a mass terrorist campaign by suffragettes who are now lionized as these heroines of equality. 
Once the war started, they suspended their agitation for the vote. Oh, they also attacked police officers and parliamentarians. They tried to assassinate Sir Herbert Asquith when he was riding in a an open motor carriage. I mean, it was just like they were terrorists. And yet we're now supposed to imagine that they were somehow justified in, in their incendiary rage, as I titled the, mm -hmm. the video on them. Uh, and then once the war started, they, they suspended their agitation for the vote and they started the white feather campaign. Many of the mm -hmm. same women who went around pinning white feathers in the lapels of any man not in military uniform that they saw in order to shame those men into signing up for the war effort. And they, they succeeded. Many men um, afterwards recounted their experience. Some of these were men who were home from their from the war. Yeah, or, from or the had war. won medals or had won medals. Mm, had won their... medals yeah. for bravery. Yeah. One man had had his hand blown oh, off. He yeah. showed the woman his stump while she was putting the the uh, white feather in his lapel. Some were under age and they were so shamed by being repeatedly given the white feather that they went and signed up and were then, you know, killed or mm -hmm. or hurt or just experienced mm -hmm. the hell of the First World War. And this is the the attitude of those women that we now lionize as courageous defenders of equality at this utter inability to see the humanity of men, of their own fathers and brothers and sons, and the willingness even then of many people to turn a blind eye to their violence and their hypocrisy. Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that I want to highlight really in, in the series. And that's why I wanted to give you a chance to give a, give a, a highlight of that. But And one of the reasons I wanted to focus on the vote issue is because you know, there'll be a lot of people, I mean, of course, most of them will complain about this without ever, having without ever having listened to you on this podcast. But those who listen, there'll be some people who vehemently disagree, which is allowed. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I want to point out is that episodes like that, the vote, point out things that, that are surprising, that, that basically cause you to sit back and think, what I always thought might be wrong. And that's one of the reasons why, pe why you, people like you, you and others, and maybe me and others, shouldn't be silenced in the sense that you could actually listen, even if you disagree, listen to that episode of the vote and say, wow, I didn't know those facts about men and not being able to vote or about other things. And so it, that's what's so important about the freedom of speech is, as, as my wife again was putting it to me the other day, is freedom of speech is really freedom to listen. If mm -hmm. you don't have that opportunity to listen, you'll never learn that you're wrong. And that's what my my, ex, my old late friend Christopher Hitchens argued was the most important part of keeping freedom of speech. And so I wanted to give a chance to talk about that. And I'm sure, um, as I was going to say near the end, is I'm sure I, my bet is that I'll be castigated more for my allowing you to be on than what you have to say. But in any case, we'll have to see about that. But but mm -hmm. uh, I want to I want to close because we, we, we've gone for two hours and, and, I, and I've and I've loved I, 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 the discussion. I really appreciate your being so both so eloquent and honest about these things, uh, which is I always have appreciated about you. Um, you point out that basically we're stuck already. We're not doomed, but we're stuck. That feminist theory is already sort of accepted. It's the accepted part of universities and 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 university departments, not just English departments where it used to be. But but now science departments and now institutions and science that 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 women are 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 inherently oppressed and we have to do something about it. We're now seeing a similar in the last five years critical race theory mm -hmm. has become the accepted adopted orthodoxy. Yeah, and 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 it, with a very similar thing where where facts don't necessarily if you if you question the empirical basis you're you're immediately condemned. Mm -hmm. um for this yeah and, and that and, comes and, out of feminism too i mean that it was there in the 1980s very strongly in intersectional feminist theory already it's just become mainstreamed so, right, more recently so you think the critical race theory is really really a derivative of the intersectional feminist theory do you think oh yes definitely yeah yeah it was it was there the, this idea that there were all these different axes of oppression all mm -hmm. operating on that binary model of the privileged oppressor and the victimized mm -hmm. you know innocent without agency etc that 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 began in feminist theory probably by the late 70s, but really took hold 
Uh, there was that woman, uh, Peggy McIntosh, mm -hmm. who talked about white privilege, and she was primarily a feminist initially, and then she moved into that area. And that's really, I mean, she uh, that was in the 1980s. It's very much the precursor to things like Robin DiAngelo's mm -hmm. sure. white fragility, where you know you you are you are racist. Whether you <laughs> admit it or not, if you admit it, then you're admitting yeah, it. But it, if you deny it, that just shows that you are even worse, you know, all that kind of thing. And, and yeah, that was there. It, it's 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 it, deeply but, part of, of the whole ideological the, machinery of feminism. That argument, by the way, it's what amuses me about it. It's it, it, when the moments when I'm amused and not outraged is is uh, it's just so exactly the same as the argument against witches. Mm -hmm. Which is you used to be if you if you admitted you're a witch then you're a witch and if you and, and if clearly if you did admit you're a witch, you know you were also a witch. That was your you know and if mm -hmm. you, if you threw in if you drowned, then you know then you weren't a witch. But if you didn't yeah. drown, you were a witch. And I mean there was no way out. It's the uh, and uh, and but so having having said all that um, and pointed out these problems, what can we do? Yeah, well, that's always the big question, isn't yeah, it? Isn't if it? Yeah, if, if we had the it. answer, you know, uh, we, we would be we would be working on it. Yeah. I, I, the only thing is that, um, you know, and and you, you said, you know, if, if people can just stand up, and it is very difficult, but they don't. You know, it's like the the movie that we all watch, where there's some force of evil, and and or there's a horrible bigotry that is is causing all sorts of injustice and finally you know one person refuses to go along and they stand and say no i'm not going to do this i'm not going to persecute my neighbor and then everybody else stands at the same time and the evil is defeated and everybody thinks yeah that's what i would do you know i would be one of those ones who would stand but in fact the reality is that most people don't and the the few people who do stand they get rolled over by, yeah. by the, the social justice tank and as mao said you know you kill one to warn a hundred everybody else sees that's what happens when you stand up nobody defends you and your life is destroyed and you're humiliated and you know it's yeah. awful it's rare uh, it's and, not it's uh, not it's not one one person i was going to say one man it's not it's almost it's it 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 takes a lot more than one person i mean again i i i've looked and obviously there's no magic bullet here but i've talked to people and i look at the history of sort of Mac mccarthyism and and how that eventually overcame and eventually it sure it was an it was a few people in powerful positions like uh edward R. Murrow, i guess um and others who were able to speak out journalists but more importantly i think it's when when everyone sees when ultimately the abuses are so common that everyone sees that they not just that they can be next but that 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 somehow something needs to be done it, it somehow there's a minute there's a phase transition where people suddenly mm -hmm. say this is outrageous and, and that mm -hmm. unfortunately means i as as a number of people who are close to me have said it's going to get worse before it gets going to better. Get worse. Yeah. Yes. And there's a grim satisfaction to be taken in that, unfortunately, especially for people like us who have now left academia, mm -hmm. uh, is that we will see that some of those who have been the head of the mobs who have gone mm -hmm. for good people on trivial grounds, that they themselves will be attacked and they themselves will be persecuted and it will go on. And as you say, until it finally stops or until the whole system kind of collapses. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. all in favor of trying to start new institutions, building new universities from the ground up based on merit. We long ago yeah. abandoned merit. We allowed there to be a competing good and that competing good was justice or you know, yeah. uh, social justice, yeah. uh, not justice. Mm. Um, and equality, all of that sort of thing. And, and uh, we have to get back to saying that merit can be the only good. Truth can be the only good, not, not these other inclusion, equity, et cetera. Um, you know, and that is possible. I don't see it happening very much yet, although there certainly are organizations that are attempting to resist and to bring sanity back to these institutions, but hopefully they will grow and, um, that's yeah, I, I, I look, I, I used to think, I, I, look, we're, we agree that that Sandy has to come back. I'm less more sanguine. I, 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 I'm all in favor of new institutions. I've been part of new institutions. I think it's a great example, but I don't think that's the solution. I think the old, I mean, for there, 
there are lots of people and the majority of my co ex colleagues and co colleagues in, dis in institutions who still believe in all of those principles and are working towards them. And, you know, in physics, I, I, I you know, they, they're working together to, to, to understand the, the nature of reality. It's not as if it's true that there's a, there's a sickness in, in, in a bunch of academic institutions, but it's not as if those institutions are irredeemable. And I think ultimately the solution is going to happen within them and it's not going to happen because one or two other institutions get created. Yeah. That's my own view in any case. Could, but could we'll well be. I, I do agree with you. It'll probably take a lot of time. A thousand points of light, as someone used to say, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but I also think it requires people being courageous enough to talk mm -hmm. about this, which yeah. is why I was so happy to be able to have you on and why I enjoy listening to you and talking to you. And I recommend again, whether you agree or disagree for people to listen to some of the videos, to get some of the, the, the information and, and decide, and then decide and based on an informed decision and informed consent about whether they'll, <laughs> they, about whether they agree or disagree. So thank you so much, Janice. It's, well, thank it's, you very much. That was lovely. Really yeah, enjoyed I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I did too. I, and I, I, I kind of knew I would with you or I, I hoped I'd, I'd rise to the occasion of talking to you. So, I, <laughs> so thank you for that. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.